Well, I know I shouldn't pick favorite guests on the show, but this one is pretty special. Connor is taking over the mic today, and this conversation is so special. It's the first time that we've sat down to tell our story together, and I think you're going to love hearing Connor talk about his journey, our family, and his faith. In this episode, you're going to hear me talk about my very favorite song of his. Be sure to listen to the end. It's unreleased, but I went ahead and added it to this episode. Are we podcasting? Are we currently podcasting? Welcome to uh, Got It From My Mama, a podcast (laughs) focused on um, moms who have raised people you might know. And uh, today I'm guest hosting. My name is Connor Smith, and I am the son of the uh, normal uh, hoster, uh, Jennifer Vickery Smith. Thanks for joining my podcast. (laughs) Thank you for having me, Connor. We've been trying to do this for a while. We finally made it work today. Cooper, uh, my older brother, has uh, set up everything to video. And so we are just welcoming you into our living room for a, what is today, Tuesday afternoon conversation. Oh. Where are we going, Mom? I don't know, Connor. You said you were going to lead the conversation, so we're going to let you lead. What is your least favorite song of mine? <laughs> That's where we're going to start <laughs> is wh- where, what is my least favorite song? Now, what's your favorite song of mine? Oh. We'll, just, we'll, we'll softball it. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh that is probably like you my least favorite question that people ask me about your music is is my favorite because I know how much you put into each song so I mean I, I have favorites yeah um of the songs that are out that people can go and get right now um I love why I can't leave I think that yeah. song is awesome, and I know that you love it as well. Um, that's a pretty special song. Um, I cannot wait for people to hear some of the new stuff that's coming. Mm-hmm. It is so good. It is just the best that you've ever written, and it just amazes me how much better it keeps getting. Um, you have a song that you have not released and probably never will that I love, and it's called Mama's Country Music. I love it for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. It's got some great name dropping in it. It's got the Judds. It's got George Strait. It's got Reba, all the good stuff. Yeah, at some point it'll probably premiere on this podcast. You think? And you'll convince me to make it your theme song. <laughs> but I told her today I actually wrote a song about her today called Hey Mama. I didn't believe you. Were you being serious? I was being serious. We wrote we wrote it today. So a little context. It's late in the afternoon. Connor just came straight from a right. And he did tell me he wrote a song called Hey Mama, but I thought he was joking. So tell me about the song. <laughs> it was with uh, Daniel Ross and uh, Jesse Alexander. Wow. Powerhouse room right there. And uh, Justin Wilson. Uh-huh. And uh, it was a song about, uh, it's a it's a wedding song. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you're basically um, maybe saying, "Hey, Mama, I've met the one." Probably. The it's girl. very, it's very good stuffish, Kenny Chesney. So. Ooh. Okay. Well, you know, it's I'm gonna love that. Kind of coming for advice. Um, how's the podcast been? What's been your, what's been your uh, favorite part of doing the podcast? Um, I think probably just how much I've surprised myself in um launching it and going for it Mm -hmm. I tend to be an ideas person have a lot of great ideas but um not all the time am I really good at executing and making something happen I can find a million reasons why maybe I shouldn't do something and so um I'm kind of proud of myself for for doing it and it's been great so what's one thing that you think you've you've learned from other moms that because I feel like we're kind of in a break right now where you don't have to worry too much I've been home for the last month and a half. You're about to hit it hard. I'm about though. to hit it hard in a couple of weeks, and kind of this new year of uh, getting on the road and playing these shows and all this new music. What do you think you've learned from these other moms that you're excited to put into practice? What advice am I taking? Yeah, I think actually- just like what ways have you learned of how to? Well, I think one of the things is that the thoughts and the feelings and the worries and the concerns and the highs and the lows and the joys. It's just universal. Yeah. I think that's the big thing is that I'm learning that, wow, when I was losing sleep over you going from one college bar show to drive to the next overnight, that's really normal to not sleep and to be concerned about that. Um, and then just, you know, wanting to know everything, I'm, you know, how inquisitive I am and it kind of drives you crazy that that's not abnormal for other moms either. You know, just some of the things about being supportive and being there. And, and like, I loved one of the things that Carol Dickerson, Russell's mom, said 
was basically she was talking about how Russell and Kaylee have committed to their family and taking their family on the road and not being apart from each other. So she wants to do whatever she can to help support that because that's the choice they've made. And that kind of struck me in she, what can, she kind of comes with a heart of what can I do to support them mm-hmm. at whatever stage they're at. And so they've got a toddler and so she goes on the bus when she's needed. She keeps the baby when she's needed and those kind of things. So just looking ahead at some of those things. Yeah. What do you think about the podcast, Connor? I think people might, might like to know. I think you're doing a great job. I think you're very, uh, gifted at these conversations. Um, I think we had a conversation when you started it of just, you had the idea. I had a couple questions of just heading into that, that we talked through. And I think that was a moment for us is uh, a mother son thing of just, you know, you kind of be like, Hey, do you feel comfortable with me doing this? And I think I was pretty honest with you that I'm not going to do this if you aren't okay with it. I mean, even though, my background is in interviews and and this felt like kind of a natural progression from my job. I still wanted to make sure because we're talking about public things and, and the relatability of me as a mom doing this podcast is the fact that I'm your mom and you're in the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think there was this sense for me of you're coming at it as country music, talking to moms is kind of what it's become. But at the beginning it was kind of these country music moms. And I think I felt a weird, since because I did think it was a great idea and I thought you would crush it and I thought it'd be really sweet and fans would love it I also think at the same time in my head um there was a a selfishness of like I didn't feel qualified as a country artist yet I'm still just trying to make make it happen and so early in my career uh, I think we put out my first songs ever a year and a half ago and there's still so much that I feel like you know, I don't know if any artist ever feels like they they make it, but I, I do know I feel so far from the place where I'll feel stable uh, as a country music artist. And uh, I don't know, I think there was some weird hesitations for me at the beginning. Um, but also, that's something I prayed through, and I did feel the Lord just kind of be like, hey, like, this isn't about you, you know, this job, and like, this isn't about it's your career. It's not all all about you, and it's a selfish way of looking at it. And at least it was cool to be able to support you because like you said it's like this has been your job way longer than being a country artist has been mine um and so uh i'm proud of you and i think that you've done a really good job and i listened to the russell dicker or the carol dickerson one uh-huh. while i was working out yesterday um i know you sent me a few of them before they came out and, and got to listen to those and um i do think that it's just it's cool i think a, a mom can provide a sort of point of view that, that no one else in the world can for uh, for these people. So I'm proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you did hear the very first episode. I think you were probably the first ears on the finished episode and you sent me a really sweet text. And because I, it really mattered to me what you thought of it. And so your text just kind of validated and what I was doing. And one of the things that you said is you said that these conversations with these moms really humanizes the artist and it helps you to think about them in a different way and you thought that was a really special perspective that people are going to get to hear about an artist so that meant a lot because that really was the goal I think that's been one of the big things I've learned last year is uh is this weird uh it's kind of in this this human aspect of this job and it's very uh you know, as as an artist and stepping into a spotlight and stepping into a world where a business is revolving around you, it's very uh, it's very uh, abnormal in a lot of ways. And I know for me, as a person who always looked up to every, you know these artists that I now have become friends with and collaborators with, and gone on tour with them, uh, and then just got to know them personally and and see just how real and honest and they have their same struggles and 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 their struggles might look different or like whatever it is. But they're all just humans trying to figure it out. And I think even for me, as someone who has had a limited amount of success, but you know, some success and mm-hmm. songs that people know and mm-hmm. songs that people you know have have sung back to me at shows and, and can sell tickets to to shows and you know will have people ask for like pictures and all these weird things. Um, I think there's always a perception uh, in my head of what that would feel like when it doesn't at all. It's just I feel as normal as ever you know, even more so and just kind of feel like a 
22 year old tr- kid trying to grow up and that path looks different than my friends who are graduating college this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think there's like a, a beautiful aspect of the humanness of that. And I think that's what this podcast is doing with moms and talking about their perspective of the story and their struggle in the story. And uh, I don't know, I think you said this in an interview on channel two the other day, you said how uh, fame affects everyone in the family. And I mean, even this last year with both Cooper and I out on the road for a year and a half traveling and getting in a van, getting in a, a bus, you know, going on tour, playing, you know, near a hundred shows last year, you know, probably do the same thing this year. Um, what do you think has been the biggest shift in our family over the last year and a half through because of my career? The biggest shift, I guess, would just be that um, we're a pretty tight family. And so I'm not used to having to kind of schedule around or, um, you know, we love to do Sunday supper in our family as often as we can. And to have to look at a calendar and be like, okay, are the boys even in town? Or when is the next weekend that they'll be in town? And just kind of adjusting to to what that looks like. The opposite side of that is that um, when your dad and I can go to shows together, I love that we're all together. And so, you know, you guys are kind of doing your own thing and we're doing ours during the day, but at the show, we're all just kind of relishing in the opportunities in what your career is providing for our family. And, and do you enjoy, uh, do you enjoy this being my career? Do I enjoy it being your career? Yeah, because you're so happy and I've known for so long that you were meant to do this. So yeah. Like, if, when I have a son and you have a grandson, <laughs> will you hope that he does, he becomes a musician or would you, would you hope he shies away from it? It's probably too soon in your career for me to make an know, opinion. Yeah. To really have an opinion on that. But no, I just want him to do whatever the Lord has intended for him. And you're going to feel the same way. You're just, you know, even though you've had a guitar in your hand since you were four years old, you know, if you had decided through high school that you wanted to do a more traditional route, that would have been okay too. But it was so evident. That Probably better is... for you if I had done that. <laughs> no. no. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to the beginning, you know, I feel like we've talked about this story so many times. Mm-hmm. Are you, or do you find it interesting how fascinated people are with your story, with our story? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's a story that living in feels so normal. But when I hear it and when I watch back, I I just it's so it's so obvious to see the God God's hand on it. Yeah, I feel the same way that it was like we lived it. We like if I I feel like if I had heard the same story being told from someone else's story, I'd be like, wow, else. that's crazy. You <laughs> I know? feel the same way. And when you hear someone tell it, you're just like, oh wow, yeah, that that is how this happened. And but down at the to time, the we were details, in the of it. BMI at nine, and your job, and mm-hmm. the way I was writing songs every day. And, I mean, it's not like our story is something we've exaggerated either. No, um, not at all. I mean, I remember going into the third grade playing songs I was writing for my class. Or um, The craziest one to me was the preschool note that you pulled out the other day that mm-hmm. when I was, what, three, four? Yeah, so I have a note. Um, for a very short period of time, we lived in Pennsylvania, Um uh, Connor's dad works in healthcare, and so we moved up there um, for him to work on more of a project. We were only going to be there for a couple of years, and Connor went to a school in Chester Springs, Pennsylvania called the Montgomery School, and he was in the three years three-year-old program so it was preschool and I remember this distinctly and I remember show and tell and you taking your guitar you had just turned four because that's when you got your first guitar there's video of this too yeah I think there is but they'd send home these progress reports and so your progress report literally says Connor walks around the classroom making up songs all day his mother says he does this at home too (laughs) and when I read that and found that note, I'm like, oh my goodness. Well, I think what's crazy about that is that's before your job in Nashville. That's before you were interviewing songwriters. That's uh-huh. before I ever got a guitar. That's be- so it's like, that was already there. And then you, and like I said, in a million times, you know, I feel like my story is one of having a gift to do something and then being in a perfect environment to foster that. Mm-hmm. And in that, there is no 
songwriting background in our family. There's no music background in, in our family. You know, dad famously sang uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman at y'all's wedding, correct? <laughs> yes, he did. Um, I will be here. Uh, but other than that, there really is no uh, music. And then um, I think, and then look at Cooper and I both kind of taking such creative routes. And yeah. um, I mean, Cooper's more talented than I in, in, in many, many ways. Many ways. <laughs> um, and so I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting to see the way. The way that it, like, reading the story back, once again, it's just like, wow, God's been really good. It's something I was just thinking of when you said that, when you look back at, okay, this note when you were three years old about making up songs, the way you became so attached to your guitar. We always say while other kids had to take a stuffed animal or a teddy bear on a road trip, we had to lug a huge guitar because that was your security, was having that guitar. But I found a Christmas list of Coopers the other day when he's like seven, six, seven years old and he wanted a flip camera. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, that's, it's so interesting. And I think that that's one of the other things that, um, like, I enjoy talking to these other moms about. But if you'll foster those things in your kids, the things that they love and you know, encourage that and share that and provide what they need to be able to do that. I've got, you know, Cooper out here as a film director and actor and editor and videographer and now on the road together with you and then you, the guitar that you took to is what's going to make your living and support your family. I just, I think that's Good such Lord a willing. cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not there yet. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, what do you think? Here's a, uh, not me, not music related. Okay. Going back, thinking about my personality now, who I am as a 22 year old adult or whatever word you put there. Um, going back to early on, early years, what's a story that you point to that kind of where you saw that personality early on? Does that make sense? The personality that you have now? Yeah. Or, okay. Well, I can talk about the vast difference in your personality now. Sure. And from when you were little. So Connor was um, a very shy baby. He was definitely attached to my hip, wanted to be held all the time. And his brother, who is two years and nine months older, was the most independent child. And so I had this, you know, new baby that did not want to be left anywhere. He did not reach out and go to other people easily when they'd reach for them. And then up until he was about four years old, he would cling to, I should say you would, <laughs> cling mm -hmm. to my leg. You didn't speak when spoken to in public, those kind of things. You were so, so shy. And then we really saw that. And again, it sounds like one of those made up stories, but we saw that change when you got the guitar and you would sing in front of our family and we would all be clap and just, you know, Connor, that was amazing. You loved the performance aspect of it and the praise that you received from it. And so it made you want to be more extroverted. It made you be the kid wanting to bring the guitar and play and show and tell as opposed to, you know, hiding in the back of the room. Yeah. But you're still an introverted person. I think that's interesting. And someone asked me in an interview the other day about what were some of the things people may be surprised to know about you. And, you know, there's some good ones. The first thing I'll say is that you're really funny. You're a very funny person with a quick wick. Not as funny you as your brother. You hear that, Cooper? <laughs> 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 Cooper said, I never said you weren't. But um, Cooper's the funniest in our family, that's for sure. But um, in y'all's sense of humor is our Cooper's the different. entertainer yeah. of the family. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm I'm probably quick in the same way that I'm song, I write songs. Yeah, I would say so. But you're just quick witted and you're very funny. But you also um, are more introverted. Like you have to, you can go so long and be the front and the center and all of that. But you have to be able to step back and decompress and, and be alone. And, you know, that's something as a mom, I kind of had to learn about you as, as, you know, we get to know our kids and as you're changing and evolving and to understand the, how important that downtime is for you. Yeah, this definitely isn't a job that is uh, conducive to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the interesting parts of the job is uh, the expectations to always be turned on and to always kind of, and I do, and I do know that like I feel like when I and I feel like a lot of artists will say this when I step on a stage, it's kind of like you become something else and you kind of become a uh, not a character, but just like you're personifying your. Uh, 
whatever the word is, you're kind of bringing to life all those things in you that when you're off stage, it's very different. Mm -hmm. You're still authentic and genuine when you're on stage, sure. but you are almost stepping it's into... like you're turning dials up of just like, all my energy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's kind of like coming up. Um, and have you ever heard me say that? I think that's interesting that you said that because people, you know, everyone's like, what's it like to watch him, you know, when he's on stage? And I always say, and I think that's something that's kind of surprised me, but when you're, when you, you know, that pre-roll song starts playing and then you come out and you're Connor Smith on stage, I feel like I'm watching Connor Smith on stage as opposed to my boy up there doing his thing. Does that make sense? A little bit. It's surprising to me, but really? it does. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I think I take such a pride in entertaining and such a pride in being an entertainer. And I feel like that whole, the whole thing for me is just about confidence. Mm -hmm. Cause I think people are just drawn to someone who is confident mm -hmm. and on a stage in front of people. I think people will feel safe and comfortable when they they see that you're safe and comfortable up there, in an interesting way, and that's kind of what I've I've seen in the best performers, um, and so for me, that's been the biggest thing to learn, of just like, man, when you walk in with confidence, knowing that like, hey, your job is just to give them, let them have fun, and give them a good time, and kind of lead, uh, this experience for them where they get to like kind of just let go of everything for, a few hours, and, um there's such a responsibility in that and such like a joy in that. Mm -hmm. And it kind of takes away all the nerves because no one is sitting there caring if you mess up a line or if your band hits the wrong note, or if you slip and fall on stage, right. which I'll, I do often. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not often. Uh, People always ask me, um, do you get nervous? I don't, I, I haven't gotten nervous. I remember uh, the moment I, I realized I, I wasn't, didn't get nervous anymore. And it's really kind of for everything. I, recently I spoke at, uh, my grandpa's funeral, mm -hmm. Papa Joe's funeral. And I was kind of expecting to start freaking out and nervous because that's speaking and, 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 a lot of pressure. and a different, obviously a, a very different thing. Um, but I never really did. And obviously that's the Holy spirit in that moment in that environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember the moment I, I recognized I didn't get nervous anymore was, um, when I played Billy Bob's with Thomas Rhett, oh. uh, we were, I'd kind of gone randomly. This was 2020. No music was out. <clears throat> Me and Thomas were just kind of becoming friends. Um, and, and friends is a loose term at that time. But I went out to the show and I was on his bus. Um, and uh, and a guy named Forrest, who's the lead singer of a band called Surfaces. Yeah. Which is dad's favorite band, by the way. <laughs> yes, it is. There's um, a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, we were on the bus and a bunch of Thomas's friends and, and the kind of like last minute TR's about to go on. He goes, Forrest, you're coming out. Uh, and Connor, you're going to come out and sing one. He's like, sing whatever you want. And I was like, shoot. So with no preparation, with no anything, TR was just going to hand me a guitar in the like dead middle of his show. And just to give some context, Philly Bob's is not a small club in Texas. <laughs> I think it's like the biggest honky tonk in, uh, the world yeah. or in America. And, and, um, so, uh, Either way, I just remember that I walked out on stage, played played a song that night, and uh, it was just kind of one of one of those moments for me where I just recognized that oh shoot, like I don't really get those nerves, those stage fright uh, anymore, which is such such a blessing. Yeah, and I'd say the only time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, since then, grand or the only Opry. time I guess that you'd say would be the Grand Ole Opry, because I know that uh, the butterflies were definitely um, at work then. <laughs> yeah, that that. Uh, that place is just so sacred and so different. And, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just that and Red Rocks this year were like just specific moments where like stepping on that stage felt so significant, mm -hmm. uh, and like really nothing you can compare it to, you know? So yeah. really thankful for that. Yeah. So we've established that, um, kind of music was the thing so early on and you continued writing. I think a sweet story is, um, again, where I just feel like God was so distinctly laying out this path, but you had a guitar in your hand every day, you you know, walk in the door from school, off the school bus, grab the guitar, be in your room, you know, writing, whatever that means for, you know, six and seven year old. And for you, it really did mean that you were, you always say you were writing songs before you could actually write them out because you were writing them in your head. And I still can't spell. So yeah, that's all. always been a problem. <laughs> But what I distinctly remember is you wanted to, you and your brother both asked to take guitar lessons. 
And so Cooper I wasn't worried about. He was, um, you know, was a couple years older. And I thought, okay, we could probably do guitar lessons. But you were six years old at the time. And honestly, physically could barely get the strength in your, your fingers to wrap around to do the chords. Because you have to have the, you've got to put pressure on the chords to play them. And so I thought, somebody's going to think I'm insane if I ask someone to give the six-year-old boy guitar lessons. But we certainly couldn't let Cooper have them and you not. And so I put, at the time, Craigslist was the only way that you really found someone. That's where we found Jeff, was That's on where, Craigslist. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so I put an ad on Craigslist, and I was very specific. And I said that I was looking for a young, energetic Christian, those were my three adjectives I used, guitar teacher willing to come into my home and teach my two boys guitar lessons. Young, energetic Christian. I think the first song we ever learned was, uh, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Is that right, Cooper? <laughs> yeah. Cooper's recording this for us, so he's, he's standing by. Um, yeah, that was the first one. and I, I mean, I feel like I could hear y'all practicing that over and over and over back in those days. I remember, I remember one song uh, early on I wrote called G-O-D. <laughs> yeah and it was just like god that's how you spell god or whatever and i remember i was upstairs in the bonus room like scribbling uh in in the notebook and i remember yelling down to you in the living room like mom how do you spell god <laughs> so i don't remember that. that's where we were at when we were writing songs it, that definitely tells you how uh -huh. how young you were so cooper picked up the guitar super easy he's always been a really good guitar player and then but you worked so hard i never had to ask you to practice um, he came every week and I never had to say, are you ready for your lesson? You were counting down the days. You were just, you know, it was Jeff coming today and he was great. And he taught you guys worship songs. And then we were so fortunate to go to a church that really gave you a stage and a platform, had a youth minister that just really believed in nurturing, you know, kids who were interested in worship music. And so you guys went to, as you got older, to band practice every week at the church and started playing. And, um, then, you know, we'd go early and sign up for open mic nights at Puckett's, anywhere that you could have a, you know, a platform and a stage. And another thing I distinctly remember is going and standing in line with you at the Bluebird mm -hmm. for hours. I was, uh, I was remembering, uh, so we did the Bluebird, played the open mic night, and uh, I actually saw a journal about this, which is what made me remember it. Um, but the Bluebird was doing uh, you audition, and yeah. you could play in rounds, essentially. Yes. And so they did an audition. We were all excited. I was probably 14, maybe 15 at the time. And uh, so I go, and I sign up, and I audition uh, for the Bluebird. And I get up there, and I was, like, ready to go, and I bombed. Do you remember this? Yes, I totally remember it. Like, you were so disappointed. I absolutely butchered it. Like it was the worst a minute and a half of music I've ever done. <laughs> like I messed up the words. I forgot the words. I stopped halfway through. And you only get a verse and a chorus, I right? Was pitch, like, yeah. Because it was, so many people. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, you had to be the youngest one there trying to get a spot. Yeah, and I remember there were like people, because I think I was already like kind of talking to publishing companies at the time. Uh-huh. And, uh, one of the guys that was like thinking about signing me was one of the judges and I just <laughs> bombed and uh, I was so disappointed. And then like, I think a month later we got a call that the Bluebird had picked me to play. Uh, so I guess it wasn't as miserable as I remembered it, but I remember uh, telling you that we got the email that you had been selected to come back and be a regular performer and you were stunned. You're like, like, there's that's no not way. True. <laughs> it is crazy. I, I look back at those seasons of, you know, about 15, we started shopping for a publishing deal <clears throat> and uh, had people that you know, really believed in me and uh, wanted to sign me. And then that was kind of the first taste was was, was 15, maybe start of 16, when uh, I started to kind of get those meetings. And, and I remember the company that I was meeting with passed, which I was so disappointed at the time. And it was one of those things where you, you're so frustrated. It was kind of always my dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they passed. And then um, about six months later, uh, it's one of the the craziest stories ever. We're, so we're in, um, we are in Montana on a family vacation and, uh, Cooper and I were kind of shooting videos while we were out there. And, uh, we shot this video where we were in Montana, um, on the Blackfoot river. And it was me singing uh, cop car by Sam Hunt, just a cover. And I like, we sh shot the video 
and I remember listening to it and like not loving it and like wasn't going to post it, but I'd kind of like, I, but because I, I knew Cooper would be mad because we, I'd made him spend so much time on it. So like, I kind of have to post it. So I posted it. I, I tagged the writers in it. Um, well that night as, as we were sitting at dinner, um, I just said randomly kind of out of nowhere, I just said, uh, I said, man, top five people that I would want to work with in Nashville, like Zach Crow is on that list. Like I would just love to work with, with Zach. Like he's just, he was, uh, it was in the middle of like Sam Hunt's kind of massive years. Yeah. And he had produced, um, Carrie Underwood, had, Dustin yeah. Lynch, like so many people that Keith Urban and, yeah. and whatever. And, and I listened to a podcast of his, uh, that week. And that's kind of why he was on my mind. And I was just like, man, he just seems like such a good guy. And I love his music and I'd love to work with him. The very next day, after I speak that out, the very next day, uh, Zach Crow follows me on Instagram, and I get an email that night um, from my now manager. And my manager uh, had heard, had seen the video of me singing Cop Car sent to him by Zach Crow. Um, so a week from that day, when I was 16, I was sitting at Zach Crow's house in his studio uh, with the guy that would become my manager, and uh, we pretty much started working together. And so Zach uh, and my manager, Brad, kind of became my team in that moment at 16, signed a publishing deal with Zach. Zach is now my producer, which is just like, you can't write up a more God story. It's one of those things you're like coincidences, like that's just not, uh, you know, coincidence isn't a thing. Um, And so that was kind of the moment where, where things started to kick into gear of, it went from chasing this dream to like, all right, here we are. And uh, and then, I mean, we spent five years from there developing everything and just, I was going to high school, I was going, uh, writing songs in the afternoon, coming back for the baseball games and then, uh, recording, you know, in the afternoon. And then right when I graduated high school, when everybody's going to college, I signed my record deal with Big Machine. And, um, and then about two years later, we start putting out music. Crazy. So that's kind of the story. I mean when you look back at that, what are the highlight, what are the moments you remember the most of like uh, either celebrations or disappointments and over that course of, uh, I mean, going until we put out the first song, like there was such a long stretch of, you know, starting at six years old, that first guitar lesson to signing a record deal at 18 and uh, to see me go from writing songs in my bed to writing songs on Music Row yeah, with people, yeah. like kind of what was your perspective and all that? Well, you tell such a, you know, shortened version of all the things that happened to help kind of sum it up. But I mean, it's truly just so overwhelming. You know, when you look back at all of the things that happened, I can remember going back to the Bluebird that when you played that first time you were asked to come play and, and you know, we've had a couple people there that wanted to know, does he have management? Does he have a producer? Does he have, and that was kind of the first time somebody had said, you know, you're good enough to to have all that, you know, though I remember that being a big deal. The whole story you told about what happened in Montana. I mean, our whole family kind of our jaw drops when we think about the progression of all that and, um, going with you to meet with a manager at 16 years old. I remember being in a room, um, before you could drive and we were at one of the big publishing companies and you played some of your songs. And at the time, we hadn't really talked about the artist thing. You truly just wanted to be a songwriter. At the heart of it all, that's that's what you wanted to do. And I can remember, do you remember who, do you know who I'm talking about? He basically looked at you and he said, you do realize you're an artist, don't you? And you look over at me with that little mischievous grin that you have, you know, and he was like, why would you want to give your songs away? Like, why are you not you know, we can do the publishing deal thing, but this is a big thing. I think I still have publishers that tell me that. They're like, send me like any song. They're like, do you want me to pitch this? If you ask, like, pitch it, pitch it. Like, so I always want, uh, I always just love the idea of other artists cutting songs that I've written. I think there's just a lot of respect yeah. that comes in that. Yeah, there's, that's always been one of your, your biggest goals. And I think that that is, I know where your talent lies and all of that. And, you know, the artist thing is so, so hard. The balls are dropping in the right places and you're rocking and rolling and all that. But at the end of the day, and I know that you're going to be so successful as a songwriter, whether you're cutting your own songs or other people are. Good Lord willing. Yep. We'll see. Yep. Um, what do you think has been your proudest moment over the last year and a half? Mm. I think you've grown tremendously in the last year, just as an individual and as a person. And this has really been um, 
a big year of maturity for you in a lot of ways. I think emotionally and career wise as a leader, um, so many of those those things. Trial by fire in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's and there's so many things that people don't see or hear, and you know don't need to but it's just the things that that help you to grow up and we've all been through them and still go through them but watching you lead this past year has been awesome somebody asked me the other day what it was that makes me the most proud about you and I said it's how you how I see you treat people when you're on the road getting to see you on the road and what that looked like this year was really special for your dad and I you know I remember one of the very first venues you were opening for Sam Hunt And I flew in, it was down in Florida, and I really got there like an hour before the show, and I hadn't seen you or your brother yet, I flew in, Ubered over to the venue, and a security guard, when I got there, right before I went back to like the green room and where you guys are, before he would let me back, he said, I want to talk to you for a second, and he was just like, your son is a special guy, he said, he he watched the way that you treated, you know, the sound crew, that all the people before the show ever began. And he was the security guard at the door. I don't think and you ever told me that. Yeah, yeah. It was just really sweet and kind. And I just know how important that is. And I see, you know, the people, people always want to tell your mama they get things like that. So I have a lot of people, the bus driver that, who you know, who will stop me and just say, this is a good boy you've raised. You know, ultimately they're trying to give me a compliment, but so kind. And those are the things I love to hear. Um, I think from just genuine like pride of you and what you're doing in your career. I don't think anything will be able to top the Grand Ole Opry for our whole family. That was incredibly special and you made it special for us by what you had kind of in store to do. And the funny story is as a debut artist on the Grand Ole Opry, you get two songs and you're kind of required to do and want to do your radio single, which at the time was a song called learn from it. But then for the second song, you told me that you were going to play the song that had gone viral that year, I Hate Alabama. And I remember just being so vastly disappointed that that was the song was, you had chosen. I was in a uh, Bass Pro <laughs> Shop somewhere on radio tour. I was on the phone with you, and you're like, what song are you playing? And in my head, I knew that I was going to do Jesus and me. And, uh, I, was just like, I, I learned from it, and I Hate Alabama. And you were... Uh, you were so mad. You're like, no, you're not doing that song. Like, I was not mad. I was disappointed. Like, you're not doing that at the Grand Old Opry, Connor. Okay, this is what we call his Jennifer voice. And Cooper has one and Connor has one. That was the less extreme version of it. But um, <laughs> I said, oh, you're right. I'll do why I can't leave. Like, just change my mind that quick. And you're like, well, that was easy. Um, and that should have been my worst, my uh, first yeah. red flag because you totally agreed with me. And you're like, yeah, you're right. I'll just do why I can't leave. Ugh. I actually found another journal. Uh a couple of days ago, about a week ago. And it was a journal I wrote the uh, day after I wrote Jesus and Me. Oh, really? And it said, yesterday I wrote the best song I've ever written. It's ah. called Jesus and Me. And I just, I wrote, I said, Lord, do whatever you want with this song. Like, if you want this song to be for my family and I, like, let that be. If you want people to hear it, I would let, like, let that be, Lord. Like, I trust you with this song. It feels, like, special. Wow. And uh, I, it was cool to read that and then see what that song has become. Yeah. Um, just such a special moment for us and, and for um, just my career. I just don't think there will ever be a moment that will ever like, I, I can't imagine a, mo- a, a moment that carries more emotion mm. for me because it genuinely felt like a wedding day of just like standing there in the circle, looking around and having all the people that were the reason you got there, mm. there to celebrate mm-hmm. you. Um, and uh and so it's just so cool. And then, of course, to have the Grand Ole Opry pick me as like their artist of the month, and then go back the you know two or three other times I've gotten to play it, uh, and have them really become a part of my whole career, um, it's pretty crazy. But yeah, but that moment, so you. that moment, that um, moment, and and before the night, it's a story. Before the night, I was gonna play this song called Jesus and Me. It's about my great grandparents. And you guys had no idea at all. You wrote it at 14 years old. Yeah, and I, I, I'd written it at 14. The day I wrote it, you told me. The day I played it for you, you told me. You said you're going to play that song at the Grand Old Opry. That's probably one of my favorite stories I've um, Yeah, because you were right. And <laughs> uh, and then uh, I played on my debut. And But before that afternoon, um, you and Dad came up to me and said, hey, we want to talk to you. And Dad handed me my great-grandpa's pocket knife. 
um, and just said, uh, I want you to have this on stage with you tonight. Um, and in my head, I knew what I was going to sing the song about my great grandpa and y'all had no idea. And we kind of all cried on the porch together in that moment because it was so sweet. And so, uh, that was a moment that, uh, that's, that's one that I know I'll tell my grandkids about, you know, mm-hmm, for sure. I just mentioned talking about, you know, what I've seen in you and the growth in this past year of being on the road, of being kind of the CEO of your company, of this, of what has become Connor Smith and the band and the road crew and all the things. How would you say that you've grown? It's been, I mean, night and day. I don't even know. I think just everywhere, I think, you know, stepping into this career and kind of being coming to just this wide-eyed uh just trying to figure it out and figure out who I am inside of it and figure out uh how to be that person and I think this is an industry that pulls you in so many different directions um it's constantly dependent on you and and it's constantly dependent on what you did the day before and how good your song was and how many tickets you sold last night and um it's just kind of this never-ending cycle and so I think for me over the last year, it's been a year of like, uh, and also just like growing up, I think being 22 and figuring out who I am, who I want to be as a man and as a, uh, as a son and as a, you know, husband one day, a father one day. And, and, um, just looking at all those things of just like, man, I have such an awesome opportunity right now, uh, that have, I've had so many open doors that have obviously been the Lord and, and just, um, been really gifted uh, throughout my life to do this. And I've always felt like it was for a greater purpose. And I've always felt like it was so I could honor the Lord, um, in a way through these country songs and through my life. And I think there just comes a certain point where you have to make the decision. Am I going to do that or not? And I don't think that's a decision you can make halfway. So I think just figuring that out this year. Um, and then also just finding security in who I am outside of the music. So I think the one thing I learned the most over the last year, and I, I owe a lot of the credit to Thomas for teaching me this as a mentor, is that you're never content. You're never going to be at peace with where you're at in your career, and you're never going to be content, and you're never going to think, I made it. You're never going to uh, not look around at other artists and wish you were doing better. You're never going to uh, sell an amount of tickets the night before to think, oh, man, I'll be happy with my career for the rest of my life. It's all every at every stage at every level. You're gonna want more. You're gonna want a better song. You're want, gonna want the next hit. You're gonna want the next sold out tour. Um, and so I think I just came to learn that if I can't be content here, then I won't be content there. Mm. And what I mean is just like if I can't, you know, here I am now where I've had a a steady progression of uh, of growth. And I've had songs that have worked. I have people that, you know, know these songs. But it also hasn't been unsustainable. It hasn't been crazy. You know, it hasn't been, at times, it's been slower than I wanted it to be. And at times, there were uh, moments last year where I I looked and, like, I don't know how to, we're going to, I don't know if I have a song good enough to sustain this or what next year is going to look like or coming off this Thomas Rhett tour, if I'm going to, you know, have anything to follow it and of course i'm stepping into this year now and it's perfect and it's exactly what it should be um which is just what happens when you trust the lord but um i just came to the point where i was like if i can't be content here then when i'm selling out arenas one day i won't i'll be just as uncontent or discontent whatever the word is Mm -hmm. so i think coming to to learn that and then like coming to really focus on what it means to the Bible verse says, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. I think learning that, of, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just focus on who I am as a man and, and be the best version of myself uh, as a leader and as a friend um, and as a person. And then I think outside of that, I can be the best songwriter and the best artist um, and the best performer. And so I don't know, it's an ever growing thing and ever evolving thing. But I think that's the way I've grown the most in this last year, just kind of that confidence in, in who I want to be. Mm-hmm. I think as a, as a natural born writer, you've always been um, a journaler, but you've really committed mm-hmm. in the last several months to um, maybe longer to, to digging in. And, and why mm-hmm. is that therapeutic? Like, how does that, it's become really important to you? Because I've watched my life. It was my New Year's resolution last year, to like really do it every day. 
and it's because I watched my, I've, I've, we've told the story so many times over the last, since this journey started of, of what the Lord has done. And I just, he's obviously writing a story. Mm. And so if he's going to write a story, then I want to write it down. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's one of those things that, uh, emotions and life and just this journey that I'm on with the Lord and, and what he's doing and what he's uh, kind of anointed me to do and uh, the talents he's given me and the calling he's placed in my life. Like I just see where he's opening doors that are just beyond my wildest belief. Uh, another story being that we got to a point in 2021 where like I had signed my record for two years. I uh, wanted songs out desperately. And I was just at a place where I was just like, I don't know what to do anymore. Like I've worked so hard. I've spent all this time. I've written every single day I could on zoom and just like, I worked as hard as I could and no one cared. At least is what it felt like with the record label. It just like, no one had, couldn't get anybody's attention. And, and, um, it just kind of felt like this desperate. I'll never get songs out, you know, which is so dramatic. But I remember, uh, I journaled, um, that night I just, I was mad and I was just kind of yelling at God. And I was just kind of one of those David prayers where you just start yelling at God and just saying, Lord, I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, I'm working as hard as I can. I'm, I'm trying to like do everything right. And I'm writing these songs and I'm just like pouring my heart out and no one cares. And I was like, so if anything's going to happen, you're going to have to do this. And, uh, I just was honest with God and uh, the very next journal entry, which was three days later, it, the journal entry said, God, thank you so much. Last night, Thomas Rhett called the head of my record label and told him he wants to take me on tour and that I need to put songs out. Thomas and I didn't even have a friend. Like, we had met twice. Wow. And so it's just when I see those moments and when I journal those moments, I get to look back and just realize how good God's been. And so then mm -hmm. when I'm in the middle of a tour and I'm hearing all these things and feeling all these things and feeling like, you know, my song dies at radio and I don't feel like I've written a good song in months. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay the salaries of these guys. Which and are all honest if, things that you dealt with this year. And, and, you know, the band feels like it's falling apart. Like, and everything is just fire all around me. I can look back at that journal and go, hey, God's got me. And wherever he's going to take me, he's going to take me. And I don't, it's not my stress to carry. Like, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, through Thanksgiving, you know, present your request to the Lord. So I can come to the Lord and say, God, thank you. Uh, I trust you. Here's what I need. And here's what I'm stressing about. Uh, but I'm just going to trust you and do everything I can. But I, I know that at the end of the day, you're going to handle it. And at every moment he's handled it. And, you know, we look at this year, like, I'm about to put out the best songs of my career that I think are going to really take it to the next level, um, take the live show to the next level. I've got a band around me that I absolutely love and adore and trust. Mm -hmm. uh, we got great news about touring this year and who I'm going to go out and tour with. Um, are we sharing that? Um, we, I mean, I don't know if you'll have to delete it or not by the time you put it out, but going out on tour with Luke Bryan, you know, this summer, July Amazing. through August. And, Amazing. <laughs> Um, we're so excited so happy for you and so i don't know i just i look back at that and it's just so much more fruitful that i get to journal uh, and and have those things written down you know mm. it's just a visual reminder of the lord's faithfulness absolutely and when you see it all written out like that and yeah it's such a great way to remind you i'm so proud of you and and that's what i'm most proud of is seeing you one you know that you have a purpose for your platform. There's a reason that God's opened the doors that he's opened. And for you to be um, intentionally drawing so close to him through this is, um, there's nothing that can make me more proud. All the music, all the everything aside, it's that for sure. Good, a good mama. I got it from my mama. <laughs> I have to ask you that. <clears throat> what did you get from your mama? I mean, we actually talked about this on Christmas dinner. <laughs> the other night, uh, <clears throat> you said your face. Yeah, I got my face. If you look at, <laughs> if you look at baby pictures of us, it's just the same person, basically. Um, and then uh, on Facebook, that'll tag 
when there's a picture of me, they'll tag it as her. Yeah. Or on her phone, I can open up her phone. Connor can open my phone with facial recognition, which is crazy. Um, uh, I got uh, I think the creativity uh, aspect of things, the the journalist, the I think there's a level of depth you probably have to have as a reporter. Um, I think some of that that layers of depth. Um, that I got from you and, uh, and then my media training skills. <laughs> so what do you, what do you think I got from you? Um, I don't know. I see a lot of it. It's funny, both of you, some of it's probably not good. Some of it probably is good, but what do you see in Cooper and what do you see in me? Like, I don't know. I would say the depth that you mentioned probably, um, I think some of your tender side might've come from your mama. Um, and I hope your love for the Lord came from your family, your, mm -hmm. your upbringing a little bit. What's been the coolest thing about Cooper and I working together? Oh my goodness. Well, when y'all aren't fighting like typical brothers do, I love seeing you guys work on a goal or, or when you're, um, you have the learn from it video. I feel like you both really contributed to what that was going to be. And that was all Cooper. That was... I just said, okay, I'll show up, and he crushed it. But just just seeing both of you use your God-given talents together out on the road, I mean, how cool is that to get to work with your brother? You know, you guys are both given very vastly different skill sets, even though some of them do match up, but the way that they complement each other for him to be, I mean, every video that you were putting out at 14, 15, 16 years old, Cooper Smith shot. Yeah. And but even growing up, like, he was getting better by taking videos of me. And so I was learning how to be on camera or how to sing on pitch or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which most of the time I didn't, but <clears throat> we were being able to practice those, those gifts together, which has served us both. I think so, so well. And it's been cool that, you know, as I've kind of grown in this industry, he has too, you know, at, at, at the same speed and just like people that uh, know his work and kind of reach out to Cooper to work with, to work with him because they've seen something he's done for me. And, um, I've had so many people all the time like, dude, I did not know Cooper Smith was your brother. Like, I just thought he did all your videos. <laughs> I was like, no, we've lived together for a while. Um, so it's crazy. I love it. What is it like when, um, mom and dad roll up in the RV and come to your shows or like, does our enthusiasm bother you a little bit or are you, do you love having us at your shows? I think you go. I think you go to love it, you know? <laughs> I think, That's a uh, terrible answer. Um, no, I, I mean I think you have a y'all have a bigger bus than me now, so uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, no, it's sweet. It's sweet. To, I think y'all were always uh, such supportive parents and always there at everything. And, you know, I think at first that was travel baseball, and y'all would come to every you know every game you could. And I think the only game you ever missed was my first home run. Oh which man, you still, talk about regrets in life. Um, wow, and, I did. Uh, and, and so I think I think that y'all's travel and travel baseball it kind of just switched to coming to, to to my shows. Which you know for dad everything is a sports analogy, and that's what he says. He's you know basically like, okay, if our son was in the MLB, we would be there yeah. to watch him <clears throat> at at the plate. Yeah. And so you know anything that we can go to, um, we want to see you shine, and and it is a, a great privilege that we're able to do that. We are good parents. Thank you, Connor. Love you. That wrap it. Yeah. Yep, I'm pretty much beaming. That was really special. Thank you so much to Cooper for filming and recording this episode. Don't forget, you can go also watch it on YouTube. And this recorded episode is going to be quite the keepsake for our family. You heard us mention an unreleased song that I love. Now, this is just a demo, but I think you're going to love it too. It's called Mama's Country Music. Mama in the kitchen, daddy in the yard Butter on the biscuits, good on the heart Sunday after church, day of rest was a day of work Radio sitting right above the sink They count down and she would sing Along with the troubadours 
Found the truth in those three chords And when the effing is doubting I feel like that kid again Raised up on the holy ground of my hometown Blue cottage truck door speakers, windows roll down Daddy's lessons, preachers prayers Do they help get me here? But what takes me back every time I listen to it Is mama's country music Mom said George could do no wrong She turned it up when we became on Now every time I hear fancy old chair I'm right back there Raised up on the holy ground of my hometown Blue collar chuck door speakers, windows roll down Daddy's lessons, preachers pray That we live by the stories of stop time, like the soundtrack to our life. Raised up on the holy ground of my hometown, blue collar truck door speakers, windows roll down. Daddy's lessons, preachers' prayers. Do they help get me here? But what takes me back? Every time I listen to it, with mama's country.